everybody. My name is Christine O'Kelly. I'm the Age Friendly University Global Network Coordinator from Dublin City University, Ireland. Today I'm going to speak to you about the Age Friendly University Initiative, about why we developed it, how we did it, what it looks like in practice and how our vision has grown into a global network and why you should be part of it. There'll be some voices from a student in DCU and from an older person attending in DCU and I hope you'll enjoy what I'm going to speak about. But to start, I'll give you a little bit of background on DCU. So the university is 40 years old this year. It's um, a university that has um, its background in enterprise and technology. It was established as a response to industry so that we would have a pool of well-trained, um, academically qualified um, students coming out in response to industry into the deficit there was at the time in industry. And it is pioneering uh, initiatives that have been adopted by other Irish education institutions. For example, it has an access programme which targets students in disadvantaged areas and a mandatory industrial placement in third year so that our students have been coming out of the university both job ready and with excellent academic qualifications because they have that third year experience completely embedded in industry. It's an innovative and dynamic institution. Um, I feel it's very proactive and engaged. It looks to see where future opportunities lie and how to maximise these, not only to meet the needs for our students and employers, but to transform lives and society uh, through engagement with our stakeholders and the wider community. And I believe there's no better example of this than the actual Age Friendly University Initiative. So I'm sure you're wondering if you're a University of Enterprise and Technology, why would you be interested in ageing? But we looked at um, what we saw was the rise in demographics. For example, in Ireland, 11% of our population is over 65. So it's relatively modest in terms of the rest of the world. For example, Malta has a, an aging population of 19% and Germany has a population of 26%. And a European Commission report out last year showed Ireland has both the highest birth rate and one of the lowest death rates uh, in the European Union. And as our aging population is set to double in the next 20 years, 20 years or so we want to really be prepared and I think that's reflective um, of all the global demographic uh, trends. We also saw opportunities to harness the expertise of staff within DCU. I mean, we wanted to create a critical mass of expertise in staff in ageing. We wanted to engage students and older people to inform product development and harness technology. For example, uh, telecare and assisted living devices. Uh, and these, you know, with the focus to enable older people to live and uh, remain as long as possible in their own homes. We also looked at research uh, that looked at engaging older people as citizen researchers and experts in their own right to inform our research and product development. And this brought really unexpected uh, examples from people being on campus. For example, the relationship which developed between older people and our students, you know, the longevity dividend and how older people brought a richness to our campus, engaging with students through in mentoring and taking part in campus opportunity. We also saw that the impact of intergenerational engagement on our students was really strong. I mean, these students are our future leaders and employers and they've it's this whole project has contributed to challenging stereotypes raise awareness of age and ageism and actually help our students inform their aging process and we also saw the impact on older people who came into DCU. I mean, they're very keen to learn something new, to stay fit and healthy. They remain active and unchallenged and to enjoy the social and cultural opportunities on offer. And in addition to that, of course, they're also contributing to the economic capital of the university. Um, you know, they, they, they frequent the coffee places, you know, they frequent, we've, we've lots of, um, businesses on the campus. We have a chemist and we have a, a, like a pharmacy. We have a bookshop, we have the library, we have a hair salon, all of these things. So in effect, the campus is like a mini, uh, a mini city. And you know, while applying the Age Friendly Cities program to it, um, overall, I think the Age Friendly University um, principles can also be applied in terms of the learning structures within third level. The other thing we looked at was the um, the legacy and benefits that older people we now enjoy now because of older people and we saw that um you know we have better working conditions and free education and we also wanted to give back but we also saw the power of, of older people politically for example in ireland they set an example to unite and the regular voters and politically active so it was very important to us that we um we had that engagement with them 
So this slide shows the milestones we've passed um, over the last number of years. So in 2010, the working group was established with stakeholders and those stakeholders were staff and students from the university, older people's organisations and older people from the local community. And the work was informed. Um, we had terms of reference that were informed by the WHO Age Friendly Cities programme. So while the Age Friendly Cities programme had a specific thematic uh, approach to how they were going to do the work, we actually looked at that and said, well, how could we look at that within the context of a third level in institution and that's how the the 10 principles evolved and um, they're fairly generic so that people can interpret them and apply them whatever way they wish to in their own environment and at the time we thought about this in the context of DCU but then we had a visit from Arizona State and the University of Strathclyde who really liked this idea this approach and they endorsed the principles and that was the genesis of the age-friendly global network so in 2014, there was just DCU, Arizona State and Strathclyde. And now in 2020, we have 70 universities representing Europe, Southeast Asia, North America and Australia more recently. And it's really growing. So it's clearly resonating with the higher education sector. Um, and I think it's really interesting the way people are interpreting the, um, the, the 10 principles, because some universities look at them uh, in terms of maybe approaching it um, from the point of view of institutional change. So they're only interested in what's happening within the institution in terms of the, their dialogue with say staff in the institution or students in the inst institution, where most of them seem to be approaching it in terms of societal benefit. And I think that's, it's really interesting how people are doing it and we're not prescriptive about that. Also, um, you have to think about, if you're thinking of joining the network, um, is it, is it um, you know, contributing to your strategic plan, is it contributing to your mission, to your visions? And of course, more recently, um, it's actually contributing to the sustainable development goals. And they're all considerations that are not made lightly. So, you know, at an institution level, there's quite a bit of work involved in saying, well, do we want to join this and what, what would be the benefits to the university? But I think overall, even if you don't join the network, I think looking at that and frame and looking at the framework that there is, that it allows that framework, you know, it's not perfect, but it's a framework that exists and people can use it to use it to um, to inform their own work um, in terms of aging. And we've had two global conferences, which has been really successful. And um, Professor Alexandra Kalachi, who's the founding father of the Age Friendly Movement, um, he's really, really supportive of the work we've been doing in DCU over the last number of years. So this slide uh, shows the first of the five. We have 10 principles altogether, and this is the first five. So you can see it's to engage with older people in all the core activities. We're looking at enhancing personal and career development and second careers, these sort of transition type programs, uh, recognizing the range of education needs, promoting intergenerational learning. And I'm going to speak about that in a bit more detail further on in the slide presentation, because we're talking about students and older people in particular, and widening access to online education opportunities for we have a, a, a program called DCU Connected, which has about um, 1,600 people on it uh, of all different ages. And um, they're sort of geographically located in various parts of the world. And the interesting thing is we do a program called Irish 101, which is on the Future Learn platform. So it's a free program on Irish uh, language and culture. And if anybody's interested, they could have a look at that. So it's, it's Irish 101 if you want to look, look at that on the Future Learn platform. So these are the remaining principles and uh, this one here, university's research agenda is really, really important to us in DCU. And I'm sure it's as important in other universities as well, the whole research agenda. But um, one of the things we really want to recognize in DCU is older people as experts in aging. And it's very important to us to have them as co-collaborators, co-design, uh, and co-researchers in the whole research on the whole research agenda. So whatever um, research project is going on in aging, um, we have older people involved in it um, from the very outset, from the implementation, from the, the conception, right through to the implementation of the project. And um, that's very important to us. Number seven there looks at um, the understanding of students of the longevity dividend. And I've spoken about that in a bit more detail further on. So 
just going to point that out. The the sec the next one then number eight is accessing um enhanced access for older students to the university's range of wealth and wellness health and wellness programs, and that's a very conscious uh, decision we made around promoting health and wellness and promoting positive aging. And one of our our first conference we actually had was on universities as engines to support uh, positive and active aging, and I think that's a real unique um, place that the university sector can occupy around supporting that for older adults. Then number nine is to engage actively with the university's own retired community. We didn't have a huge number of retirees because we're only 40 years old, but um, in uh, 2017, um, we incorporated two other colleges incorporated with us and uh, they had a they were very well established and they brought in a new cohort of uh, a wider cohort of retirees. So they had now have their own reading room and they had their own space and their own activities, which is super. And then of course, to, to ensure a regular dialogue with organisations representing the interests of ageing populations. And I think I'm going to talk about that a bit more in the next slide because that's really very important as well. So this slide um, shows the pillars that in DCU that we work on in terms of age friendly. Um, I set these up because I found it quite difficult to navigate in the university when I first arrived um, because uh, schools and faculties tend to work lilos and I didn't really know how to how, who were the movers and shakers in the university that I needed to influence to get the, the, the principles implemented. And uh, this has worked really well. It's a multidisciplinary team. We meet three times a year formally, but in, informally we meet, I work with them all right across the campus. And you can see the representation, uh, the, the, what they represent on the campus. Um, it just makes it much easier to have, um, you know, when you're filling in a funding application to have that cohesion uh, within the university around how we can apply for funding and how how strengthens our funding applications and our work uh, embeds the work of, of uh, age friendly right across right across the campus which is great and then of course the absolutely most important people in all of this are the older people so we have an expert advisory board and we work with these collectively again and individually and of course our Irish senior citizens parliament which represents over 36,000 older people they are actually housed on the DCU campus as part of that commitment. There's also a DCU 3LA, which is the Lifelong Learning Association, and that's a peer led group comprising older people who are uh, active on the campus. They're, they're usually part, they're participants who take part in the program in DCU, and they also organise social activities, you know, I suppose it's the equivalent of a student union or a student society, and they organise all their events and um, have social activities as part of that, that group. So these are just some of the collaborations and initiatives with stakeholders that we've had. Um, as I mentioned, the Parliament, the student engagement in terms of that is some of our students um, spend their third year interplacement, as I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, with some of these organisations. So the next generation management students who are master's students work in terms of marketing and community based research. Third age, we have a number of projects with them that we do. Um, free computer classes, our students to, to deliver the free computer classes. We have a listening project that, that basically harnesses the expertise of third age who are a senior, they set up a senior helpline, a national senior helpline in Ireland. It's a befriending telephone service and they have very highly trained older people who are volunteers on their, their, their senior helpline. And we wondered about how we could um, harness that expertise for the benefit of students in DCU. And they came in to do the listening project. So they come in at the beginning of a semester um, the first semester of a year and they ran a telephone line for eight weeks and some of the queries they would get would be around people who are lonely or isolated that maybe their first time away from home or there's sometimes international students that would ring up and you get queries from people just being lonely and wanting someone to chat to right to like how do I cook cabbage so and they're trained to listen to all of this now if somebody is is um in a much in a, in a poor place and needs um um a different type of intervention they're also they also are trained to pass that person onto a, a, a more appropriate service as well and um, operation conversation is um a project we have in dcu and we run it every it's, it's a one-day event 
and lots of the other uh, universities are doing this as well now. So Operation Conversation celebrates is marked on the UN Day of Older People on October the 1st and this usually has a theme for the day and every year we have this walk around a park and we have like speakers corners so we have students and older people who stand on a, a corner and they speak to the theme on the day. It's led out usually by our Minister for Older People in Ireland and some of our older people cha older persons champions and it's usually a great day and um, it's, it's a great conversation builder between older people and younger people and our students to get take part as well which is fantastic. Then the Gingerbread Project is um, uh, another charity event we run and that's for um, the IKEA sponsored gingerbread houses every Christmas for us and we we sell the gingerbread houses and we get sponsorship from the sugar company as well and this decorating competitions and things like that and the funding goes between third age and alone which is um, a housing service so that's a nice little they're nice little sort of projects that's you know at, at one end of the scale and then we have you know more in-depth research going on at a different sense at this other end of the scale then we have staff volunteering on our lifelong learning program and they give two hours per semester. Uh, we have an established support program for staff caring for older parents or relatives. And this really is around um, dealing with the emotional issues that come with caring for uh, an older person, because sometimes those things are not, there's, there's no ancillary services to, to cope when people are, to help you when people are feeling that they can't cope or that they're having difficulty in navigation to a, an experience that they've never had to do before. And sometimes there's feelings of, um, you know, regret or anger or loss all of these things that happen to you so we run a program twice a year for staff and dcu uh, for this um, for caring for an older part parent or, or partner and then we of course we have staff at our, our our helix our all voluntary staff who are older people who volunteer to support the helix which is a big theater on the dcu campus we win a schools award every year uh, it marks the eu day of intergenerational and solidarity which is april the 29th and we have uh, awards for schools that show can show intergenerational engagement and these would be promoting in innovative practices and intergenerational engagement so there could be things like paired reading you know um, skills training skills development um, and these would be mutual skills between older people and younger people sometimes they're technological sometimes they're more sort of hands-on like maybe a craft skill or something like that uh, one lady last year who won it uh, wrote a diary about a transformation experience she had about going into a nursing home and um, she won the she won the main award last year and the other thing too the other aspect of this is for us it's a it's a recruitment opportunity as well for our students for to get students coming into the university sector so um, they're really fantastic events uh, and the the three LA group are the judges on that so there's really a lot of collaborate collaboration and cooperation going on for those events and then as I mentioned the three LA also have their regular social events as well my this name is Catherine, is Catherine Clancy, Clancy and, Catherine and is an I'm an older and student in DCU. Well. So in 2013, I was looking around. I had never been to a college, um, finished my education at second level. And I was wondering, was there anywhere where I could pursue something um, just for fun? And I stumbled happily on DCU. It was an age-friendly university. So with a little bit of trepidation, I arrived and I decided that I was beginning to research my own family tree. So I joined the genealogy um, department and had a wonderful um, two semesters there that actually set me on the road then of finding my own family tree. When that was finished then, I joined um, a module that had several um, subject spread over six months. There was politics, which I'm very interested in. There was law. There was another um, couple of lectures on how the EU has impacted on our legal system here. And another one that I had taken was in English literature on James Joyce. And then I decided having done my genealogy um, course that maybe I'd write my own memoir. It has been the most wonderful five years of my life. It opened up a lot of avenues for me. Um, I'm halfway through my life story now, and I have made so many friends um, in the last five years. That's the other um, dimension or aspect 
to um, the Age Friendly University. It opens up new friendships for you at a time in your life where you might have considered that you'd already made all your friends. But you come to these um, friendships now with no baggage. Your children are grown up. We have grandkids. So it's a different path we're on and we're able to share with one another. Um, unfortunately, now the pandemic has hit us, but a lot of us are still in contact um, on Zoom. What the future holds for us because of the pandemic, we're not sure. But we do know that whatever help Christine can give to us, she will give to us. And we look forward to the future. We're not looking back and we're not going to worry about it. And hopefully um, we will all meet again, not virtually, but actually in person. So some of the opportunities we have for older people in DCU comprise academic and customised courses. We have two programmes. One is our Love of Lifelong Learning programme. And that's where the, the I mentioned earlier on about staff volunteering for two hours um, in the semester. So what I usually do is I go to a school or faculty and I ask them if they would give me a number of uh, lectures for two hours once in the semester and from that then we, we devise a module so it could be on psychology or it could be on English literature or on maybe everyday science and uh, that means that the advantage to us is, is that first of all it means that uh, the lecture is only commissioned to two hours once in that in the semester and also for the older people it means that they, they might be a bit worried about coming back into a university campus so it's a great opportunity for dipping your toe into the water and just testing you know, do I like sitting in a classroom and navigating around the university, listening to somebody speaking? And if they don't like the content that week, there's a different different lecture the following week who might have a different style of lecturing and is going to be lecturing on um, in the same in the same vein of the same topic, but in a different way. So I think that's very important. And then the second program we run are the academic programs, and that's from the undergraduate program. Uh, there is a cost for both. For one of them, uh, we charge a very minimal sixty euros, and uh, for the academic, for to come in and do it for audit, it's a hundred euros, which is very good because they get a student um, email account, they get access to all the facilities in DCU, and they have their their eight week program. And of course, they can do it for credit as well. But we don't find much of a demand for credit programs. There's also a fitness program, it's called Active for Life and we have over 800 people a week coming in on that and the beauty about that is, is that it's um, using up the gym during the day when normally it wouldn't be occupied and there's a number of students from the Health and Human Performance uh, School and they uh, they come and they work in the gym with the older people to make sure the exercises are being you know completed properly and that there's any queries they help them there with those. We have a Dementia Elevator program which is around uh, supporting people with dementia or those looking after people with dementia and there's also free online training that you can download for people working in the leisure banking or retail industries when they're confronted with somebody with dementia. Uh, we have the DC Orion Academy and that's promoting entrepreneurship and there's a special program called the Propeller Program and that's to support people who are over 50 who want to develop their own enterprise. Uh, we have mentoring of course in the university so we have students, we have academics who senior academics who mentor junior academics, we have um, students who mentor older people, we have older people who mentor, mentor students, so there's a large mentoring, amount of mentoring going on. Sometimes we have um, specific projects where we need an expert in, in some aspect, it could be maybe in I don't know the prison prison system or something, and they would work with students, and their expertise is really useful in that in 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 those areas. And then, of course, we have all the cultural activities and social activities that uh, people can engage with in the university. That's all, always on an ongoing basis. So these two principles are ones I've sort of alluded to in the in the in the broader when I was talking more broadly about the principles, and one is about intergenerational learning uh, to around facilitating uh, reciprocal sharing and about understanding the students, um, understanding of students of the longevity dividend. Now, one of the things I, is I'm always conscious of is, and it's one of the reasons I came to DCU, because I'd worked in ageing for a very long time, probably about 30 years, and I've never I never see things happening quickly. It takes a very long time to, to get things to happen. 
And the policies that are being developed and implemented now are the things that are going to affect those students that have landed into our university. So as I mentioned earlier, they're the leaders and employers of tomorrow. But what's happening now in terms of government policy is going to affect them and they need to be as as aware and au fait with those policies that they are around policies to do with disability or with um, you know ethnicity or discrimination any of these areas and it's one of the main reasons I wanted to come and work in the university and it's one of the main reasons because I wanted to have access to that cohort of very young people that we could influence and how we could change the way they were looking at their own future and I think it's when you see further on, Lauren is one of our students, a master's student, and it's the impact it made on her because when she came into DCU um, at the very beginning, she came in in 2014 when I came in and I did a student flyer that talked about why is age-friendly university important? Now, she said she never paid any attention to this flyer. She knew what we were doing. She put it in her bag and she forgot all about it until she started working. And then the impact of it really hit her. And then she realised, I have to do something about this. Now, since then, she finished her master's programme. And in actual fact, this year, she's been accepted for a PhD, which is fantastic. But I think her understanding, she was only one of a number of students. And, you know, it's not going to, you can't put an old head on young shoulders. That's absolutely true. But it's allowing that seed to, to drop and think about how they're going to age and how they're going to understand their own aging and what's involved in that and be aware of what's going on. And um, I think that's, it's, it's really put me in a very unique position and put age friendly universities in a very unique position because we can influence that. And uh, I think that's one of the greatest strengths of the age friendly university, the university programme. This slide uh, refers to academic credits for volunteering that I mentioned at the outset. And in our master's programme, we give these things called pods, personal opportunities for development. Uh, the students have to get 450 pods outside their academic work and they get that uh, towards, the, towards their final master's um, award. And um, I think the impact of these, when you look at them, you know, around what the students are doing, whether they're actually working for the organisations or volunteering with me, um, I think it's very important because it sets that seed in their mind, as I mentioned earlier, around um, ageing, around promoting intergenerational exchange, uh, around challenging stereotypes and promoting that friendship and understanding the wisdom there is in ageing. And it has had an impact where some of the master's students have gone on to pursue um, other research in ageing or actually completed their master's um, research project on uh, an element of ageing. And this is a picture of uh, some of the digital exchange students that we were doing um, earlier this year. And uh, these are always packed, these classes. Last semester, now this is the semester one last year, we trained over 400. Um, over the over the course of the semester, and this was the second cohort in for semester two, which we obviously had to ch had to end because of uh, COVID. But um, they're hugely social events as well as being interactive and engaging for the older people and the students. And we usually have far more students volunteering on the program than we have older people to do it. So there's usually a waiting list for people to get involved. Um, but they're really great. They're really great fun. So this is um, going to be a small story from Hi, Lauren. Hi, my name is Lauren. And, um, I I'm hope you find a recent graduate as of the as, Analytical as Science Programme in DCU. So when I was in final year, I was working part time and I took a job working in a home care company in Dublin. When I started there, I was just doing regular filing every day and it became more apparent as I was putting files away of how many clients for the home care company were suffering with depression due to isolation. There's a lot of students in DCU that currently volunteer and I thought they're missing out on such a big group of people that could go and meet with older people even just to have a cup of tea or do a crossword or do Sudoku every week so then that led me on to meeting with Christine and I was telling her I really wanted to set something up maybe a befriending service in DCU where students could go and meet with an older person in their area for one hour per week this led me on to looking at the Alone Society because they're already well established. They're well known for, they already have a befriending service in place. 
So through this, I met with a loan and DCU together, and we decided that the best course of action would be to set up a society in DCU. Sometimes there's this misconception that we have nothing in common, and like, why would we want to sit down having a cup of tea and talking about what's going on in the world with someone that's uh, 30 or 40 years older than us? But I think there was a lot of students in the same mindset of me who maybe didn't have their grandparents around anymore and would love to be able to go and visit someone for an hour a week and it'd be mutually beneficial for us both. My hopes for the future for the Alone Society is that it'll be a great success. We've seen from the recent census that Ireland has a growing population. The resources currently available to older people are being overwhelmed. So unless we start bringing in new initiatives like this and branching out into different groups such as students asking them to volunteer, I don't know what it, the situation is going to look like in 10 or 20 years. So I'm hoping that we'll get loads of volunteers and even if we only make a difference in one person's life and we make one every week for them a little bit happier, then I think all of the work will be worth it at the end. This slide shows um, a photograph of uh, some of the participants at a special meeting of the Age Friendly University Network members in 2018. There's just a selection of them here that were able to come for that particular meeting. And uh, in the picture there you'll see um, on the right hand side there with the red and white striped tie, um, that's Professor Alexander Kalachi who's the founding father of the Age Friendly movement. And Alex um, is a real champion for the Age Friendly University Network and really feels that we need to embed um, ageing as, um, as a curriculum in the curriculum in universities and around, um, and around um, uh, in influencing policy development within the Age Friendly University Network and he's of the work we've been doing over the last number of years. And I suppose when you're looking at why would you join us, so I suppose these are the elements of why people would, would join the network around developing these position and policy statements really to influence either national policy or, or even local government around ex exchanging expertise and staff. And we've already had a number of staff exchanges. We had Professor Cathy Eden from Arizona State who visited, visited in 2018. And uh, we were to have another academic visiting from Eastern Michigan University, but just as she was putting her foot on the plane to come over, um, President Trump announced the, the lockdown for Europe. So, uh, but we have deferred that. We haven't, we haven't um, 
cancelled it. It's just been deferred until another time. We've had Professor Lim from Pai Che University in South Korea. And then we've hosted a large delegation, numbers of delegations of students that have come over to work with us. And we're learning all the time. Um, you know, we, we developed these 10 principles for ourselves initially. And um, it's very interesting to see how they've been interpreted. And I think it's very important as well from the point of view of what's happening on the ground in your own university and understanding you know, how can we enhance this? How can we, uh, you know, really maximize this as an opportunity? And we've learned a lot from other universities. And, you know, while we set the ball rolling, we're not claiming that we're, we, we're the know-it-alls about it, but we're always interested to hear what other people are doing. For example, our 3LA group that I mentioned, the Lifelong Learning Association, the University of Strathclyde have a group that's been set up for 40 years. So we learned a lot about how to set the group up, how to manage the group, what were their expectations, setting them up with, um, you know, uh, terms of reference and a framework of how to run, how to fund it, all of those things. And um, I mean, we're very interested in hearing from people. And even if you just want to have a chat about it, my contact details are at the end of the slides and I'd love to hear from you. Uh, and even just to shoot the breeze, it's not something that's going to happen overnight if you are interested in joining. It's something you have to put a bit of work into and um, it sometimes takes up two years. So you might get, I might get a call from a university expressing an interest in joining. I go through the whole process with them, then they go off and, you know, I recommend people to set up a working group and look at, you know, does it meet your strategic plan? Does it meet your mission? Does it meet your vision is it something you want to do around the sustainable development goals what do you want out of it and all of that whole process is documented and we will be as i think i mentioned launching a website um it'll actually be the end of september and uh, and that's for the members only a members only website to share information so if you are interested in talking to us we'd love to hear from you my details are at the end of the slides and as I said, these are just a small number of the members. I can't get 70 logos now in the slide anymore, but um, you can just see the range of members we have there. And it's, it's great to see it happening, you know. Well, this is the end of my presentation. I'd like to thank you all for listening. And, um, and I'm around to uh, answer any questions you might have. I'd also like to thank Mercedes and her colleagues for inviting me to take part in this event. And uh, as I said, if you, anybody wants to email me or uh, give me a call, my, my details are there. So I'm open for questions. Thank you.